Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. He comes to us from San Diego, and let's give a warm welcome to Cliff R. Hi, I'm Cliff Roach, and I'm an alcoholic. And it's nice to be here. I'd like to thank Jim, and I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me and making me feel right at home. Gave me a beautiful room overlooking the demolition of the swimming pool. God, that's fascinating. I, I, that's a job for alcoholics, isn't it? Just tear the cement out in great chunks. Uh, had a wonderful time so far, and, uh, and uh, you ought to see how beautiful you look right now. This first time I've ever been in Reno sober. Uh, it's a very interesting place. Uh, uh, I was just thinking, you know, one of the things about having a round up here, you know, if the speaker's lousy, you just think about, think of the money I'm saving sitting in here. You know, it doesn't make you know, saving me a fortune also. Uh, no, but my my Alanon and I were married here in Reno. I haven't held that against you at all. Uh, let's let bygones be bygones. Uh, she isn't with me here. We're having our San Diego roundup right now. By the way, I want to clear the record right here. I'm, I'm from the San Diego area. I'm not from San Diego itself. I'm from a little town called Oceanside, which is a little bit above San Diego. But it was close enough for the committee. And as I say, my al couldn't come with me this time. I always hate it when she can't come because... Uh, I always like to introduce her as my Al Anon. <laughs> it's kind of my way of getting even. You know, you know they introduce us. Have you met my alcoholic? <laughs> sit up, boy. Sit up. Sit up. I never know which paw to put out. You know, bunch of weirdos. You ever watch them drink? I don't understand social drinkers at all, anyway. And the most social drinkers I've ever seen are Alan Mons. <laughs> oh, mine is disgusting. I had his buddy, Big Ken. He came in about two years after I did. And I'll never forget that night because, you know, Pat doesn't, my wife's name is Pat, and most of the black belts are. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, the black belts, uh, you got to get the smile down to get the black belt, you know. You just can't go around releasing people in anger or anything like that. You got to get the smile. To see the smile, you can't show any teeth. I'm releasing you. I always said the Mona Lisa was an Al Anon. Yeah. Kind of explains it, doesn't it, you know? Well, anyway. My buddy Kenny was over at the house, and uh, he was his first night on the program, and uh, Pat doesn't drink around newcomers. I wouldn't want to get that impression, but, you know, he was an old friend, and he and I were drinking buddies from years ago, and she was having a glass of wine that night, you know, and she's talking, and she's sipping. She talks a little more, and, some, and old Kenny quit the, quit the conversation altogether. Finally, after about ten minutes, he says, You want to take the goddamn thing or not? <laughs> <laughs> and she was especially cool that night. She says, no, I think I'll save the rest for tomorrow. <laughs> I drove the guy to L.A. You know, he never said a word the whole way. Just, he was stunned. A couple of Christmases ago, she goes down to get her, uh, her supply for the Christmas season, a pint So she brings it home. You know, it's that rum and brandy crap they you make hot stuff out of. Alcoholics, you know, you throw that stuff up, the batter gets in your nose, and you can't get it out. You know, I'm four days looking like this, you know. And she opens up the cupboard, you know, to put this rot gut in there, and uh, she starts giggling. So I went out to see what she's giggling about, and the bottle from last year was still there. She said, I forgot. <laughs> Do you ever forget where a bottle was? <laughs> I'm in the cupboard in the kitchen, Cliff. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. My buddy Al McGee, he says they're not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to tell one more story and then I'm going to talk about me but anyway we're going up to L.A. My, I was driving my wife and these other four al uh, and we're going up to L.A. and we stop for dinner see and this waiter comes over to the table he says uh, would you like a cocktail before dinner you should have watched that it was decision time uh, do you want one well I don't care if you'll have one I have one well, what do you two think? I don't know. Did you ever have to make a decision? <laughs> that guy threw the towel over the arm. Yeah, let's go. Three right here. But old Sarah says, I don't remember what Sarah said exactly, but it sounded to me like she says to this waiter, she said, uh, do you have kumquat daiquiris? The guy said, no, we don't have any of those. She says, never mind. I didn't let that go by, okay? <laughs> I said, Sarah, will you look behind the bar? I said, there's 500 bottles back there. What the hell's the difference? What that? And then they all went. Remember that, huh? Don't you think you had a few too many? I saw I said, no, nah, you had a few too few. <laughs> I just... Love that expression. But that, see, that is the way I, I didn't drink like them at all. I love to drink. I like almost everything about drinking. I hear people get up these podiums, I just want to punch their face. You know, they say, I never cared for the taste of alcohol. How'd you get here, lady? <laughs> you care for the taste of this. <clears throat> oh, I love the taste of booze, you know. I like rum and brandy and all that stuff, but I like sour mash bourbon whiskey the best. Ah, there's one. <laughs> Yellowstone or I.W. Harper, Jack Daniels, any of them are good. When I was 17, my old man showed me how to drink bourbon. Everybody in my family's an alcoholic. Matter of fact, if anybody dropped by for longer than three days, they became an alcoholic, you know. Oh, man. You just had to walk by our house and you wanted to drink, you know. And uh, my dad showed me how, you'd, you know, you take a big double shot at Yellowstone was our favorite. and Just a little water, just enough to rinse your mouth. Doesn't matter if the water has ice in it or any of that nonsense. And you say, boom. <laughs> and it just burns. Down. I love that part. When it just burns all the way to the bottom and says, boom. You know. and then you just, take, you just take the water. <laughs> then you swallow the water. And then comes the best part. You breathe out through your nose. I can taste that right now. <laughs> Pardon me. Mm. Oh, is there anything better than that? Delightful flavor. And then I like it like after about 10 or 12 of those. <laughs> or 15 or 20. Or, you know, depending on the body chemistry that day. In my drinking, I see, I only tell my story. It's the only one I have, and it was a very expensive, painful story. I ain't going to get a new one for you, I'll guarantee you. But in my drinking... After about 10 or 12 of those, or 7 or 8 martinis or Manhattans or whatever, there was about 8 minutes uh, where I was okay. <laughs> you must have had an hour. I don't understand. You know, it was just kind of like... <whistles> I would just sit there. Even that last rotten couple years of my drinking, you know, I'd just sit in that greasy green chair there front of the TV set where I was talking to the newscasters who weren't on, you know. And I would just, this peace would come over me. And I wouldn't be angry and I wouldn't be afraid and I, and I wouldn't be in debt. and I, Nothing would be wrong. I was just okay. You know, for about seven, eight minutes there, I just, the, I called that serenity. A lot of times right after that, it all went downhill, you know. But at least in a 24-hour period, there was seven or eight minutes where I was okay. See, and that's the only seven or eight good minutes I ever had in my whole life before I got here. And that's the kind of drunk I am, see. When I drank, I had fun. Now, you know what I mean. Only in an AA meeting does everybody... I, mean, I would love to say that in an AA meeting. Just say, fun. And all their eyes glaze over and they all go, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You know it. Don't say that to Alan on meeting. See, they don't have fun. They have fun. Yes, we had lots of fun last night, didn't we, Cliff? But you know what I mean. Fun! <laughs> like getting the crap beat out of you and going to jail. Fun! You know. My favorite one was finding your car at the bottom of a ravine in the morning. <laughs> with you in it. <laughs> fun! Oh, I love to drink. You just get out there and get among them. And I love to dance, and I love to wear lampshades. You know? And I love to sing, and I love to fight. Unfortunately, uh, the first time I ever drank in my life, I was 15 years old. It was in Bakersfield, California. And I was uh, in this, from this Irish Catholic family. Oh, really? Yeah. No kidding. And uh, all the men in my family were rough and tough and hard to bluff, really men. Big, hairy guys knock people down. And I was four foot eleven. I weighed 89 pounds. And 12 pounds of that was pimples. You know. And I had this severe back problem. I had a big yellow streak down the middle of it. <laughs> And this other little weenie and I got behind this. We were going to this high school dance, you know, and, and this other little weenie, and I, I never met him in an AA meeting. All the one happened to him, you know, but we had this half a pint of 10 high. Remember that? Those of you who are old enough, remember that elixir of the gods? Uh, and we had two quarts of party pack, and I gagged down my quarter of a pint, and it got to the bottom, and it went boom. And I grew a lot. Uh, those damn pimples just went. <laughs> Boy, and I went to that high school dance, and you know, there were only two girls in school I could dance that were small enough. You know, four foot eleven. How many can you? I danced with all of them that night. Boy, I'd... come on, baby, let's go. And out of the... I didn't care where my face was. I just grabbed them and away I went. You know. Oh. And then I did a lot of that bumping that night. I don't know if any of you guys were bumpers. I love to do that. Watch where you're going. I bruised several guys' knees that night, you know. Watch where you're going. I had more fun than I'd ever had in my whole life. God, I had a good time. And I remember about halfway through that evening, this little voice in my head said, Hey, Cliff, where has this magic potion been? Now I know why your folks drink like they do. And I vowed, boy, to keep on drinking. A couple weeks later, we were at a beach party out to... Kern River. Remember that? Mm. You remember that. <laughs> uh, and I drank a fifth of port wine. I figured that quarter of a pint, you know, and it did it. I had a blackout. Much of my life now is hearsay from now on, you know. <laughs> Spent the rest of my life saying, I did? Oh, God, I'm sorry. But they tell me <laughs> it was related to me. I had a lot of people told me that after my I married Pat, well, then from then on, she took care of it. Uh, you know what else you did? But these people informed me the next day when I got out of jail that I had tried to whip every guy at this party, and they'd all beat hell out of me. And I tried a couple of the smaller girls, and they whipped me too. You know, and I finally picked on a cop, and I went to jail, 15 years old. And that's my drug log. <laughs> You know, lots and lots and lots and lots of times I went to those dances or whatever and I had fun. And lots and lots of times I had those blackouts. Oh, I hated blackouts. It was never my intention to blackout, ever. And I never had a good one. I've been doing a survey in the last five years in AA and I have yet to find a drunk who had good blackouts. Still got a perfect record here, you know. I never woke up in the morning and found that helped the little sisters of the poor all night or something like that, you know. When I woke up, there was blood. My blood. <laughs> because, see, when I could get enough booze in me, see, I always wanted to be tough. That's all I ever really wanted in my whole life was to be a real man. 
Marvin Macho. That was what I wanted to be. Like my dad, like my uncles, you know. I just wanted to be tough. That's all I ever wanted. I never made it. See, but I could get enough booze in me, I could become brave. <laughs> I always thought brave and tough were synonyms. Ah, <laughs> no. No, wrong. See, just about the time I'd get enough booze in me to be brave, I'd lose my muscle coordination. See? I became one of the great beating takers of all time. Oh, just, I saw a guy in the hall today. Great big, uh, you know, just the right height. <clears throat> they loved me because they could just grab the head and go. Ah, <clears throat> oh, and I was proud of those beatings. And I had trouble with the second step when I got here. You know, that's insanity. My favorite time, I woke up one time in Long Beach by the pier there, that rainbow pier. There. Four of the guys and I had come down from Bakersfield to Long Beach to have fun. And uh, I woke up in the morning, I thought I was blind. Well, I had bled on this pillow face down all night. See, when I stood up, the pillow had dried. And when I came up, the pillow came too, see. Oh, I was panicking. This other guy and I threw water on this pillow for about three quarters of an hour, got it damp enough to... You know. There was a mirror on this dress hall. I'll never forget I looked just like Quasimodo. I said, put the pillow back. But I never forget the guys that were with me. They said, they said, you were terrific, Roach. They said, you got up 19 times. You know, that's the kind of friends I had my whole life. That's the kind of friend I was. You know, if you were getting, I'd say, go get him, Bob. Get up. Don't just lie there, you know. But that's, you know, pretty much my drunk log. I'd, you know, have a lot of fun. And then I'd have those horrible blackouts and, you know, get in all kinds of trouble and go to jail and wreck cars and be beaten up all the time. And if I could see my lip, I knew it was a great night. <laughs> <laughs> I went to college in San Jose and I met this lady. And uh, the way she puts it, the rocks in her head fit the holes in mine. <laughs> and uh, we entered this 20-year suicide pact together. Uh, well, unfortunately for us, we had a dual disease. We had uh, alcoholism and Catholicism. Uh, for the great losers of Vatican roulette of all time. We had a kid every nine months and 20 minutes, as I remember it, you know. Seemed like every time I came out of a blackout. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> you know, they're all right when they're little, but when they grow up, they turn ugly. Yeah. And uh, after a number of years of doing other things, I became a school teacher. Can you imagine a drunk like me? And we moved in 1961 to the town of Oceanside, where I became a relatively successful school teacher, if that's not a contradiction. And... Uh, a couple of school teachers here. I always like to put that in. <laughs> anyway, uh, you'll be not surprised at all to know that my drinking progressed. <laughs> Hardly anybody surprised by that. Now, now, I got so paranoid about those blackouts as the years went on that, you know, I had fewer and fewer of those. I always loved to go in these clubs where I have that chart, you know, way down toward the bottom it says somewhere, onset of blackouts. <laughs> my second time I blacked out. And I got, you know, but when you're a school teacher and you have blackouts like I have, you know, you can lose your license. They can call you up to Sacramento and say, could we have that back now? You know, biting a bartender in the face is not social drinking. You know. <laughs> Where I drank, the bartenders wore clipped ties, you know, so I couldn't get them over. <laughs> you know. I was famous for that. Got a big scar and she'd say, oh, you drink where Roach does, huh? <laughs> And attack people with tire irons and that kind of thing. You know, it's, they, don't, they, they don't like school teachers to do that. It's tacky. It's all right, the students, but, you know. But anyway, I, I just became fearful, fearful of those blackouts. But alcohol and I became more and more of a team. I found it more and more impossible to live without sedation. I found that I could not negotiate a 24-hour period without getting zonked. Otherwise, I don't know what would have happened to me. Uh, I think alcohol was the best pal I ever had. Thank God I found alcohol, or I'd never be here tonight. I would be locked away somewhere, you know, or I, one time I talked up in L.A., and 
I got home, I was all wired, you know, and I, was, I had to get up early in the morning, and we had gotten HBO, so I turned on HBO. I stretched out on the couch. I said, I'll just watch this for about five minutes and get sleepy. And uh, I'm looking at this. I just turned it on, and somebody told me later the name of the movie was The Scanners. I only saw 30 seconds of the whole movie, and these two guys were having a staring contest in the movie. I don't know if any of you saw it. You know, They went, mm. The other guy went, mm. And then the other guy went, mm, and his head blew off. I mean, it was just a neck there. I didn't sleep for three days, you know. I just lay there like this, you know. You know well, I was lying there. I said, boy, I bet that guy should have drunk. You know, because I, I think that's what would have happened to me had I not had alcohol. But I just became more and more and more and more dependent on alcohol as time went on. But anyway, as I say, I was teaching there in, uh, in Oceanside. And a buddy of mine and I, he's done a program now. It took him ten years after me. He's dumb. And anyway, uh, we got this surfboard shop in, in 1965. A guy donated us this little building right down on the beach. It had been vandalized and that sort of thing. We thought, hell, we'll, we'll rent out surfboards. We'll give surf lessons. Uh, you know, we'll fix boards. We'll make a fortune. Never have to teach again. And so we fixed this building up. We put windows in it and painted it all up nice. We got a refrigerator. <laughs> and uh, I think it was like three months later we got some surfboards. No big hurry. We had these two chaise lounge chairs. Oh, what a deal for a couple of drunks, huh? Right on the wall. We became sunset connoisseurs. We used to measure uh, sunset by martinis. I'd say, looks like about a seven tonight, Woody. <laughs> the best one we ever had was a 15 martini sunset. And the sun and Woody and I went right together. Oh. They found us in the morning with a sunburned mouth. Remember that? Oh, I hate that. But, you know, we did real well with that shop. It's just really weird. We didn't do much in the evenings. <laughs> Guy come in, I like to rent a surfboard. Screw off, Charlie. We're watching the sunset now. <laughs> Big tycoons. But, unfortunately, when the weather turned, uh, business went down. And so we went back to school teaching, boring as it may be. But I went down one Sunday afternoon in 1960, February of 1965 to fix a surfboard. And that's all I was going to do. Repair a surfboard. I was not a morning drinker in 1965. Matter of fact, I was still kind of maybe a weekend drinker with a few thrown in. And I was fixing this surfboard. And I was going to get a Coke or something out of the refrigerator. And I opened it up, and Woody had been there the night before, and he left about this much vodka in a half a pint, a drink. And there was some orange juice in the refrigerator, and I thought, damn, a screwdriver tastes good. There was only enough for one. I mixed it up, and I drank it, and I went on about my business. And I love to remember this. And there were all these newcomers tonight. Thank God. I'd love to tell newcomers this. They identify. In about 20 minutes, my mind talked to me. You know, don't you? My mind still talks to me, but I don't listen. I have met the enemy. He lives right here. Only enemy I have in the world lives right in here. And uh, my mind that morning said... What a filthy trick. You finished Woody's booze off like that. <laughs> Why don't you go get him a pint? You know, just a hell of a guy. That afternoon, I got him a fifth. And I ended up, as my old man used to say, boy, I drunk. You know, just the resin all over me. The board was ruined forever. The shop was ruined forever. And I lurched home just drunk. And I told my wife, what's going on here? I'm getting drunk when I don't mean to. I said, i got to do something about this drinking. And she had cut this little thing out of the paper about AA. Don't know why she thought to do that. And uh, had a phone number on it. The next morning I called AA, and this guy Stan came over and took me to meetings in 1965. You know, it's what the old guys say, uh, you know, it's not necessary for me to have a drink after that. The guy in the back says, you were drunk Thursday. He says, yes, but it wasn't necessary. Uh, it was one of those guys that had been around the program for 40 years. You know? But I, uh, I, I thought, I didn't like AA. Well, I, you know, I went to one meeting, whether I needed it or not. Uh, I used to go to the speaker meeting there in Oceanside at 6.30 on Sunday evening. You know, I was skulked in the back door just as it was starting. And, I, well, they had this sign that said, we care, which I thought was pretty hokey. And uh, they're leaping around back here. You watch them for me, will you? 
They, they look dangerous, tell me. Well, I thought it was me for a minute. But anyway, uh, I'd go to these meetings. They had a sign that said, we care. And I waited, oh, 20 seconds after the meeting one night, and uh, nobody threw their arms around me, so I knew they were phonies. And I don't know, it's, it was just boring. I thought AA was the most <laughs> boring place. In 1965, Laugh-In was the big show. You know, I used to have this insane desire in these meetings. I just wanted to leap up and say, boring. Remember that gal used to, oh, God, I wanted to do that. Never did it. I just was boring. If I could have had a drink, I would have done it, but I didn't have enough guts, you know, so. Oh, well, they had a few guys I liked. They had these guys, you know, that had been in 39 penitentiaries and uh, 47 nut houses. You know, all the things that give you a stature on the program. Uh, <laughs> how's that go? You see, two jails equals one nut house, three nut houses equals one prison, you know. But death row, oh boy, you know. And uh, you'd be chairman right away then. I sponsor a murderer. That gives you a little juice, you know. But I want to tell you, I'm very careful with him, I'll tell you. Would you like to get in the car, Lanny? Don't this way if you want to. <laughs> But anyway, most people were like, like me and you. You know, they'd get up to this podium, and it sounded to me like all their names were Clem, and uh, the wife's name was Martha. You know, old Clem and Martha had been good, decent, worthwhile folk their whole life. But they had drunk too much. And after they'd drunk too much for a while, it really started interfering with their life. So they had put the plug... And they'd gone back to being good, decent, worthwhile folk. They had been rehabilitated. Now, my hero in 1965 was a guy named Eldridge Cleaver. For you youngsters, he was a black militant terrorist. And his politics and mine fit beautifully. You know, blow it up or burn it down. <laughs> you know. I was for peace. If you didn't agree with me, I'd kill you. I was, I was a socialist. I loved humanity, but I hated people. Uh, anyway, I'd gone down to hear Eldridge give a speech down in San Diego a couple of months before that. And Eldridge was talking about the prison system in California. And he was saying they were always trying to rehabilitate him. And he said what they'd never known was that he had never been rehabilitated. And you can't rehabilitate somebody who's never been rehabilitated. See, and that's how I felt here. Obviously, Clem and Martha, at some time in their life, had been all right. That had not been my experience. When I was, I can remember little tiny bits and snatches of my life when I was four years old. And when I was four years old, I was pissed off. And when I was four years old, I had a hole in my gut. And when I was four years old, I was full of resentment. I hated you. I didn't know why, but you had what I wanted. And I didn't know what that was. <laughs> but I knew I didn't want what I had. And I didn't want to be where I was, and I didn't know who I was, and I hated it. And I, that's the way I lived my whole life, except for the eight minutes. The only peace of mind I ever had in my life was that eight minutes. And these lunatics wanted me to give that up to hang around with Clem and Martha and put the old plug in the jug. Boring! So, uh, surprise no one, I quit going. A couple months later, I was having pizza and spaghetti, and it seemed like a glass of wine with pizza and spaghetti could not do any harm. And I had a glass of wine. My wife fainted, but it didn't bother me a bit. Uh, I drank that glass of wine, ate that pizza, then I knew down at the A&A they were really phonies, you know. Yeah, you led me to believe you have a glass of wine, hair grows on your face, you're at the moon or some guy, you know, leap out and attack old ladies and stuff. Nothing happened, nothing. A couple of weeks later, I was teaching this millionaire how to surf, and he invited me up to his millionaire condominium to have a millionaire drink with him. Cheap sucker only gave me one, too, huh? Chevis Rigo. Nothing happened. Not a thing. 
A couple of weeks later, I was up in Saratoga visiting a friend of mine. He broke out a fifth Irish whiskey, and I got drunk. So and then I was drunk for a couple of years. <laughs> now that's a slip. <laughs> These phonies with the one day in and out, you know. That's a real slip. And I, I got to coming back to AA then when the heat got on. You know, if they really had my back against the wall, I'd skulk off to AA. One time I came for 40 days, and then I was drunk for a year and a half. And then one time I came for 30 days, and then I was drunk for about another year and a half. My favorite time is I came in in the afternoon about 4 o'clock at the old club there in Oceanside. And these, old Don the Barber and these other three guys who are still sober today, they, they quadro-stepped me. Did you ever have that? They got on all four sides and just, whoa, whoa, whoa. Man, did I get the message that time. I never had it so good. And I just floated out of that club and I went over to Big John's house. He was my pal. And he was worse than me. When John came to the door, I said, John, we're alcoholics and we have to go to AA. Big John says, okay. <laughs> Give me an idea of his mental capacity. So I led old Big John off to the meeting that night and became his sponsor. And the next day, we both got drunk. <laughs> Real success story in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know what kind of drunk you are, though. See, one of the things that almost killed me is I'm a functioning alcoholic. My sponsor, you know, if he has a beer, he doesn't go to work for two years. One of the lies my old man told me, and he told me many, but one of the ones that almost killed me, he said, if you eat breakfast and you go to work, you're not an alcoholic. He never said a thing about throwing breakfast up. You know, every morning. See, and I'm the kind of drunk that I got. I get, feel like I'm getting too near the edge here. <laughs> uh, what a finale that would be! I have to when I'm working. I have to do ten times more than you to prove I'm half as good. Does anybody identify with that? See, I'm a working son of a gun, boy. I couldn't be an alcoholic. Look what I get done, and I'm just a working fool. Sick or not, I'd get up and go. That's stupid. Especially when you have sick leave. But I tell us one story. I've got to get sober here pretty soon. Okay. Uh, my, my sponsor has a little watch that buzzes, you know. He never gets out of World War II. He's going along, and then we were flying this mission buzz, and then I went to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Nobody knows what's going on. He hears the buzz, he starts getting sober. Uh, I've got to get one of those. Anyway, uh, the principal called me in one day, and I teach, among other things, speech. I love to watch him. What? And the principal called me in one day, which always made me nervous, and uh, he said, Cliff, they're having a debate and speech tournament down at San Diego State College. Now, I told you, San Diego's just 30 miles down the road. And he says, uh, why don't you get some kids? It sounds like something that would be good for them. They'd like, enjoy it. I said, okay. So I found four or five rum dums willing to give it a go. And so we go tooling off down to San Diego State to this debate and speech tournament. And we were amazed when we got... These things were big deals. You know, there were like 50 schools participating, like 500 contestants. All of them dressed better than I am tonight. You know, our kids were in Levi's and sweatshirts. What the hell do we know? You know, we got slaughtered. We didn't win a round. Now, I don't know what kind of drunk you are, but I don't like to lose. Oh, it ticks me off. I'm a bad winner, but I'm a worse loser. Mm -hmm. And I'm already steamed, and I go in the coach's room, and there are about 20 of them in there, and they all knew each other. You know how we love that? All of them are friends. I'm the only stranger in the room, and they ignored me, it seemed to me. So I hung around all day so they could ignore me longer. You know how we are? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was one guy there that really irritated me. He had a lot of hair, for one thing. That pissed me off. And uh, one of those, you know, those steel gray manes, and not a hair out of place, perfect. You know, a four hundred dollar suit on it was worth a nickel. The other coaches did this when they went in front of him. You know, uh, kind of the guru of the speech coaches, kind of the Jim D of the speech coaches. And uh, <laughs> you got that, Jim? Okay. Uh, and this guy, about two in the afternoon, suddenly turns to me, and he said. Uh, where are you from? Well, I was grateful to be spoken to. I said, Oceanside. He said, oh, where's that? Thirty miles up the cotton. The guy gave me a resentment. 
I mean, I don't mean a resentment. I mean a resentment. There wasn't a day went by where I didn't think about that sucker. I went back to that school. I went through the IQ files. I found the 50 smartest kids in the school. I'd stop a kid in the hall. I'd say, you're a debater. The kid said, I don't want to debate. I just didn't ask you that. Get your butt in the room. And they went. <laughs> they say, we don't have willpower. Ha, 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 ha. You know, every night. The other teachers went home at 4 o'clock. I'm there 9 o'clock at 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. Every half hour, another kid or two kids just going, just yelling and ranting and raving and screaming and cursing. Coaching! Some reporter one time asked uh, one of my students, what's the secret of your coach's success? The kid said, terror. <laughs> and he wasn't lying. Hey, you got any idea how much work that is? To make 50 people do what they don't want to do? Man, you've got to get tense when you do that. That really winds you up. You've got to drink when you do that. Lucky for me, <laughs> out in the glove compartment of the car, waiting for me all day, seal unbroken. See, I don't drink all day. That's kind of drunk I am. The longer it waits, the better I like it. I don't know if anybody identifies with it. Just would lie there in the glove compartment with that half a pint of vodka, you know, whatever thrifty had in the basket that week, you know. And go get him, Cliff, baby. I'm waiting for you, darling. Mm. I'd finish with that last kid. You know, I'd get in that car and I'd light those cigars I smoked in those days. And I'd open up that cheap vodka and I'd just always drink half of it. Just... God, is there anything in the world like that? My best pal just would slide, greasy stuff would just slide down there, huh? Hit the old Abanza. Oh, God, is there anything? Just made me well, put me back together again. Made life worth living. Just said, mm. I think, God damn, I'm a good coach. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd sit there in the darkness of that car and I'd smoke that cigar. And then I'd think about that gray haired son of a bitch down in Sandy. <laughs> Never a day went by where I didn't think about him. And then I'd go home and really start drinking. See, and I'm a foul mouthed drunk. And I'm a real violent drunk. And I'm a cruel drunk and a sarcastic drunk. And I got drunk every night that four or five years, that last four or five years at home. See? And I turned that house into an insane asylum. Everybody in that house was crazy. And everybody in that house hated everybody else in that house. Now, I was the head hate now, my three oldest children were in high school. This is the late 60s. Yeah. And they were completely weirdos. My oldest son, David, was working his way through high school as a hashi salesman. <laughs> Everybody's got to do something, I suppose. You know? Never had to give him any spending money. You know? I should hit him up for a fifth about once a week. <laughs> yeah, what do you need, Dad? <laughs> you know. And a hair down to his butt, you know, and his head went like this all the time. He looked like one of those little damn dolls in the back of a car, you know. He's like, Call his mother, man. Hey, man, what's for dinner? You know? And he took LSD like popcorn, you know. And they, they see those lights all the time, those guys. They're strange, those LSD freaks, you know. He used to scare the hell out of me. He'd be right in the middle of a sentence. He'd say, what was that? I'd say, I don't know. What was it? You know, that, oh. My, my, my mother-in-law was living with us, and she's a drunk, too. She'd say, I'll explain it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Man, my daughters had these boyfriends look just like my son, you know. Put the three of them on the couch together, you know, you just, Jesus Christ. And they're going out the window and doing every night, you know, doing God knows what, and, uh, and I hated that woman, not as much as she hated me, and, you know, from that lovely girl that I married, she had just become this shrew, this crazy woman, on my back all the time. I couldn't understand why. 
But anyway, we rattled around and it was just a nightmare. And I was sure if I could just unload her and those dope fiend children, I could drink like a gentleman again. But I built that speech team, by God. And in a couple of years, we won one of those speech tournaments. But I didn't say anything to the gray-haired guy. It wasn't time yet. We know when it's time, don't we? Then the next year, we won all the speech tournaments. But I didn't say anything. I can wait. I think revenge is better than Christmas, don't you? Then the next year, there was a speech tournament. There were 25 schools in the tournament. My team scored more sweepstakes points than the other 24 schools combined. Then I went up to that gray-haired sucker, and I put my nose right against his, and I said, Do you know where Oceanside is now? He got this blank look on his face. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, don't you remember about four years ago, you said to me, Oceanside, where's that? And he said, we just moved here from Nebraska. I didn't know where it was. <laughs> and that's the story of my life. Four years, this guy's lying in his bed in San Diego every night. And I'm up in Oceanside. I'll get you, son of a bitch. And he doesn't know it. He's just going through life. And I'm dying. He had no idea the vodka I drank at him, you know. That's the story of my That's how I lived my whole life. And I wondered why I needed to drink. I lived my whole life by vendetta. I had so much hatred in here for myself that I had to turn it out or my head would blow off. And so if it hadn't been for alcohol, I would have killed you or you would have had to kill me. Or they would have had to put me away somewhere where I wasn't a danger to myself and other people. Alcohol saved my life. It saved my sanity. It was the only thing that saved me until it turned on me. And my, my number one defect of character, I have come to find out through two inventories in a couple of years, self-obsessed anger. You know, I think Cliff's here in the universe goes this way. Sometimes it doesn't go right. And I get mad. When I was new, Ronald Reagan was the governor of California. I didn't like him then. Uh, and, uh, well, I told you my politics, you can imagine. Uh, and we're driving to San Diego, to L.A. My sponsor's driving me up there, and I'm talking about the governor. And I got going, I, got going, I spit all over his windshield. He had to pull off the freeway to wipe the windshield so he could see where he was going. I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, "Cliff, you know the governor is not even going to know it when you get drunk at him." You know? And on that second inventory, see, I, on the second inventory at about a year and a half, two years sober, I came to a horrible conclusion. I found that the two or three things about me that worked for me the best my whole life were my defects of character. Oh, that's painful to find that out. You know, I went to my sponsor. I don't mind giving up. The pain, but these work, Bill. Too bad. Yeah. And so self-obsessed anger, that's the one I have to deal with every day of my life. Every day. And I got it pretty well whipped except on a freeway. You know? <laughs> my al a great help. She says, yeah, they all got up this morning and said, let's go out in the freeway and get Cliff. <laughs> Always glad to help out. No. Never forget the time we were stuck in traffic. Four alcoholics in my al -Anon in the back seat, and one of the guys was speaking, and we, you know, it, was a, you know, it was backed up and it was hot, and we were all just... <laughs> and she says, well, we could think of it as a gift of time. She almost didn't make it out that time. <laughs> uh, she says, never try to cheer up an alcoholic. For anyway, right after that incident with that gray-haired guy, uh, my wife and I had one of our main events, which the neighbors have come to miss so much. And uh, I, by God, moved out. And I had a place down at the beach where I'd wanted to live anyway. 
and I had unloaded those dope fiend children in that shrew, and I was drunk all the time, and I couldn't understand it. Things should have gotten better, and they were getting worse. And I was, you know, I was missing work a lot, and I was drunk, and I couldn't understand it. And one afternoon, I, I got out of school, and I hadn't had a drink yet, and I went by the house because they were spending too much money. <laughs> and I was haranguing my wife about this money stuff, and uh, for some dumb reason, David was bobbing there. And uh, I asked a stupid question. You know, I looked at Dave and I said, Dave, what's it like not to have your old man around the house? You know, and he looked me right in the eye and he said, it's beautiful. And I don't know, alcoholism has never really been my problem. Sensitivity is my problem. I'm just too sensitive. You know? And he hurt my feelings. And I went down to that dump on the beach and I ran and raved and screamed and hollered and yelled. But I didn't take a drink. And I think that's significant. And I went out and sat on the screen porch and I watched the ocean the rest of that afternoon and into the evening. And uh, it was, that evening was one of the most beautiful sunsets I ever saw in my life. It was just beautiful. One of those magenta ones. And just about the time the sun was sitting down into the water, I had what I assume you had or you wouldn't be in this room with me tonight. I just had that moment of clarity. You know, I just saw Cliff. I guess I saw what Dave saw. I saw what I had become. When I was new, I heard Clint Hodges talk, and he said he had nickled and dimed himself to death. And when I heard that, he doesn't talk about it anymore when he talks, but I always do, because that's the story of my life. I traded in anything I ever liked about Cliff for the privilege of drinking booze. And I came to know that afternoon that everything I ever faintly, remotely liked about myself was gone. I had traded it in for the sauce. And I did not like what I saw. And I went in the bedroom and I had this old duffel bag full of stuff and I dug through it and I found the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I had read in one of my travels through the program, you know. And being an English teacher, I thought it was poorly written. Uh, poor syntax, I think. I want to tell newcomers it read a lot better this time. And I read that book. I called in sick. I didn't go to work for three days. And for three days and three nights, I read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I read all through all the stories to the end. I went back to the beginning. I read through all the stories to the end again. And on the third time through, it was the 13th of January, 1970, and it was 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was on page 63 again. And if you're new, on page 63, there is a prayer, which is step three. And it just seemed like it would be a good idea if I would kneel down on that filthy linoleum floor, on that dump on the beach, and if I would just read that prayer out loud to myself, and that's what I did. I read, God, I offer myself to Thee to build with me and to do with me as You will. Relieve me of the bondage of self. And I looked up the word bondage one time. You know what I mean? It means slavery. Relieve me of the bondage of self. And I had a spiritual awakening that morning. I just had a quiet knowledge that I was going to be all right. I had been in charge of my life for 44 years, and I was not in charge of my life anymore. I was in the hands of some power greater than I was, and I hadn't the foggiest idea what that was. But I knew that it was going to be all right, and I know that it's going to be all right tonight. Now, that's kind of a charismatic spiritual experience but I've had so many spiritual experiences on this program they're uncountable See, all my life all my life I was sure that my problem was that I was not loved enough and that's true I wasn't <laughs> you can't love me enough God knows my Ellen on tried I mean, if you got everybody in the world together, all the people in China, everywhere said, let's all love Cliff. Everybody's got together and said, mm. I said, is that all? Is that all there is? <laughs> See, but I, what I've come to learn in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is that that was not my problem. My problem was that I never loved enough. I have learned to love in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And through giving love, I have found that love is infinite, that love is inexhaustible. 
You cannot give love away. Because every time you give love away, that power in this program fills you up again. And you seem to go from a two quart to a seven quart, you know? I learned to love my children by learning to love newcomers. I had to learn to love newcomers before I could learn to love my own children. I had to learn to love you before I could learn to love my wife. The only thing I've ever gained from this program has been trying, by trying to give it away. My problem was not that I was not loved enough. My problem was I did not love enough. And I said, I've had so many spiritual experiences on this program. I was coming up on the plane today. I was thinking, I was five years sober. And we got a new principal in our school. What the hell I got thinking about this book? Uh... And he was there about three weeks. And this guy call, calls, I'm going by in the hall. He said, Cliff, could I see you a moment, please? And he closed the door to the office. Now, that should have been a spiritual awakening right there. It didn't make me nervous. He said, would you sit down? I sat down. He said, what are you up to? I said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You know? He said, well, I've been all over the school. He said, and I've been going through the IQ, uh, not the IQ, the, uh, the jackets of all the teachers, all their evaluations through the years. And he said, you've been in this district 25 years, something like that. He said, and there's nothing in your jacket that doesn't say that you're not a good teacher, that you're a good coach and a go-getter. He said, but I also found that you're a ring-tailed son of a bitch, that the girls in the office are afraid of you, that the other teachers are intimidated by you, that the other coaches fear you. He said, I've been all over this campus for three weeks and I can't find anyone who doesn't like you. You know what I did? I cried. It's like I'm doing now. You know? I just busted. I cried. I grabbed this guy and I hugged him. And I said, thank you. He didn't come near me for two years. <laughs> that guy had seen me in a hall. <laughs> See, if you're new... That might sound like I'm bragging. When I got here, I was incapable of anybody liking me because I couldn't like them. See what happened? Alcoholics and others had done that to me, and it wasn't until that moment that I knew it. Most of my spiritual awakenings come from working with dipples like Steve down here, you know, who showed up up here. <laughs> uh, you know, Steve will do something right twice a year, and uh, I'll put my arm around and say, God, that's great, Steve, you don't do that anymore. Good job. And he'll walk away. You know. And then as Steve walks away, I'll think, hey, I don't do that anymore either. And that's a spiritual awakening. You know, the old man on the hill used to say, the higher you get on the hill, the farther you can look back and see where you came from. But that morning, I didn't know anything. I knew what I had to do that morning. I had to go to Bill Blake's house. He's a little electrician there in Oceanside. Had been sober that time eight years. And I go over to Bill's house. I knew he had to be my sponsor. I knew that. All those years in and out of the program, he had impressed me. He was crazy, but he was happy. Huh? A knock on the door. I love to remember this. It was 6 o'clock that evening, the 13th of January, 1970. It's a freezing cold night, and I'm standing on the porch. The porch light wasn't on yet, and I'm alone. You know, I'd been in charge of my life for 44 years. You know what I accomplished? I got myself to my sponsor's porch alone. Nobody in the world gave a damn about me. And uh, Margie opened the door. That's Bill's wife. I have never seen anybody so glad to see another human being in my life. I mean, the lady just glowed. I mean, she just went, oh, clear. In the house I went, you know. <laughs> Pours me the first cup of eight trillion cups of coffee, you know. She said, this is wonderful. This is so nice. She said, Bill's been in such a bag lately. He's, he's been going crazy. He's had nobody to work with. This is wonderful. <laughs> and Bill comes home about 10 minutes later and says, Cliff, oh, God, damn. Yeah. In about a half an hour, I'm thinking, uh, anything else I can do to help you folks out? <laughs> Be glad to assist you in any way I can. You know? Cliff's here. We can start AA now. See, but if you're new, nobody's ever had to explain to me about this being a selfish program. It is a selfish program. Everything I do in Alcoholics Anonymous, I do for Cliff. You know, you've got to be unselfishly selfish. 
Now, if you're new, I've read that book 400 times. I study that book. That book's my Bible. And there's no place in that book, any place in that book, does it say you have to do anything cheerfully. <laughs> That's good news, newcomers. You can wait till we turn our back and go, <laughs> you know. We don't care. You can pout and moan as long as you do it. I don't know what kind of drunk the rest of these guys are, but when that phone rings at 1 o'clock in the morning, I hardly ever leap out of bed and say, A 12-step call! Oh, Glorioski! I say, why me? Why? There's nobody else in town but me. You know, I piss them all the way to the phone, and I say, Hello? Sure. What's the address? You dirty rotten, you know. See, it took my sponsor a year and a half to teach me that. No, for me to learn that. He didn't teach me anything. He just told me to do things. See, the next night, he changed. He had a blood transfusion from Attila the Hun. The next five years, the nicest thing he ever said to me was, Shut up! You know, they got guys, you know, they're sober a day and a half. Come on, Harold, get up and talk. Ten minutes. What a resentment. I wasn't allowed to talk in the car. I would say, I think, shut up. Nobody cares what you think. You don't know nothing. My third day, are you anybody a whipper? I didn't shake. I whipped. Nobody drank coffee near me, I'll guarantee I look like one of those little birds out the beach, you know. <laughs> and they always fill my coffee cup up. And we're going to Los Angeles in my, in my sponsor's uh, Lincoln Continental. <laughs> that impressed me. And uh, we're going air conditioning. We're going down the freeway. I'm in the front seat there, kicked back. He gets right beside his big semi. And he opens the electric window. <laughs> oh, jeez. I hit this. He says, love to watch those newcomers jump. <laughs> But I believe in it. I'm cruelty to newcomers forever. I'm a jelly donut. A guy taught me that. You get a newcomer, you know, and they're all green, sick. You want a jelly donut? <laughs> I love you. No, thank you. I say, okay. <laughs> that gets rid of them. But he took me all over Southern California. He took me everywhere. He took me to meetings where there was laughter and you know, and kissing and hugging and people zinging each other because he knows I can't live without that. I can't live without fun. And if you're new, I've had more fun the last two weeks than the last five years I drank. I've laughed harder and more often this weekend. You know, at the, at the goofy dinner table tonight, we all got so silly that they were going to throw us out of there, you know. Number two dinner that Jim features. I said, what's the matter with three? Eat two. You know? We were all hysterical, drinking tea, for God's sake. One was in the tea. But I've had more fun, you know. I never knew what fun was till I came here. And he took me to me. Of course, he took me to some great tunnel meetings, too, you know. He wanted me to see those. Do any of you know what great tunnel meetings? I heard Clancy talk about that. I was crawling on the floor. I laughed so hard. He said a great tunnel meetings where these six guys get together every week around the table with a bare lamp. And you stay sober. And sobriety is like a long gray tunnel. And you just trudge down that sucker. Every year a trap door opens and a cake comes down. <laughs> you can have those kind of meetings, you know. Great. We have a fourth tradition that says you can have any kind of meeting you want. Just don't wait for me. Because I'm going to go where they're laughing and scratching and kissing and hugging and zinging each other. And that's the kind of meetings he took me to a lot. And then he... I, I was very nervous. I told you, I'm sensitive. And uh, I was, had a lot of nervous breakdowns because Pat didn't go to al right away and she was vicious. She was crazy. And so I'd be walking around the block because I wasn't allowed to run away. And I would be just... Just crazy, you know. And Bill would pull up. He lives around the corner and he'd say... How are you, Cliff? That was a big mistake on his part. No, woman! I'm just having a nervous breakdown. A real one. I'm not kidding. And he would say, why don't you go get Al and take him to the meeting? 
What the hell's that got to do with the nervous? You know, it's like, said, what time is it? The guy says, the horse is dead. You know? I'd go get Al. Now, you had to know Al. He was a bigger butt than me, you know. He was a worse slipper than me. He'd been slipping for 11 years. I'd only been slipping five. What a jerk he was. So I'd go get Al and listen to his BS all the way to the meeting, sit through the meeting, then take Al home, listen to his crap all the way home. Then I'd let Al out, and I'd feel better. And I never figured that out. Or he'd tell me to go set up the meeting and make the coffee or wash the cups. Or, you know, just do, do, do. And I think it was over a year. And I finally went to him one time and said, you know, I think I got this program figured out. It doesn't matter what I think. And it certainly doesn't matter how I feel. The only thing that matters in Alcoholics Anonymous is what I do. Because if I move this, this will come later. And he smiled and he said, you got that right. And he never told me that. He made me learn that. And I'm going to give that to you free. He, when I was pretty new in the program, he took me up to hear Clancy, who I've mentioned many times. That's his sponsor. And uh, that night, Clancy talked about the steps of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he made fun of them. He took each step. He said, they're so simple. The simplistic. Goofy, dumb, simple little steps. Each one was a riotously funny talk, he said. The only thing was that he'd made fun of those steps like that for nine years, and he'd been drunk for nine years. But he had worked those dumb, simple, stupid steps for 12 years at that time, and he'd been sober for 12 years. And I laughed. Oh, God, it was a funny talk. But all the time I was laughing, I was thinking, there it is, Cliff. That's why you almost died. You thought you were too smart for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, it was right after that my sponsor and I were coming back from the men's stag in Laguna Beach where they'd hurt my feelings again. Oh, they loved me there. I was such a whiner. I'd show up at that meeting every Monday night. Me and Clean. Ah, oh, they loved me. They just... And on the way home, I told Bill for the seventh time how sensitive I am. Should have quit at six. <laughs> He looked at me. He usually yelled at me, but he was very quiet. He said, let's get this straight, Cliff. You are not sensitive. You are an immature son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. I told him, I kind of prefer sensitive. It's all the same to you. you know? <laughs> but he would have none of it. And, uh, you know, I put those two things together. I put those two things together. And see, for me, just for my sake, that's the, uh, that's the other part of my alcoholism. That's the ism part of my alcoholism. I took a drink of booze when I was 15 years old. And I relieved myself of the obligation of growing up emotionally whatsoever. But unfortunately, because I was unable to cope with the world on an emotional level, I had to drink more. Which made it more difficult for me to cope. <laughs> so I had to drink more. And so when I got here, I was a terminal case of immaturity. I mean, I was going to die of immaturity. And my Alan Honest promised me, if I die drunk, that goes on the tombstone. Cliff Roach died of immaturity. <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to have to, see, because I don't get very far away from this program. Because my higher power is in this program. See, I only know two things about God. My God has a sense of humor. That's why I know He's in this room. He loves to hear us laugh. He knows we cried enough. He loves to hear us laugh. My God thinks I'm funny. Not when I'm trying to be. He likes it when I'm a bleeding deacon. That's when I amuse him. You know, when I'm running AA. And I'm pointing out that that meeting stinks and you're not following the churches. And up in this, you know, in the stratosphere I hear. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and that ability to laugh at ourselves and not make it be a big deal. You know? Now, the beautiful thing about the program is if you won't laugh at yourself, you can always find somebody to laugh at you. At least my buddies are that way. You know? If you won't laugh at yourself, they'll do it for you. you know? But if you need them, they're there too. The love and the sharing in this program is absolutely incredible. The other thing I know about God is this. 
God is in AA again. I know that because I can see your eyes. I want to see about four rows very clearly. Now, if you're new and that sounds corny, I apologize. I don't care. I was slick when I got here, too. You know? I used to slide off chairs. I was so slick. <laughs> Remember how you used to laugh slick? <laughs> Somebody fell down and got hurt. <laughs> That's the only time I ever laughed the last five years. You know? I was sober about three days. And I went, ha! What was that? You know, scared the hell out. But I love the eyes of Alcoholics Anonymous. I love 12-step work. Bill from Vancouver knows. You know, he's like I am, man. I have to go get him. These treatment centers tick me off, you know. Uh, can't go get him dirty anymore. I love it. I'd love it. I like to go to a dirty, filthy place and find a dirty, filthy man. You know what I do when I get there? I get down and look at his eyes. You know what I see? I see my eyes when I was four years old. I see my eyes my whole life. Lack of power was my dilemma. You know, I've gotten that guy cleaned up and get him to a meeting. You know, go to a coffee shop after the meeting, sit across the table from him, and the power is in his eyes. You know, I've sponsored guys 16 years, 15 years, 14 years sober. You know, their lives all turn around and they're happy, successful. Man, and I got to watch the light come out of their eyes. If you don't believe in a spiritual part of this program, then you haven't done that. If you're new and you don't believe what I say, just do this for me. I'm giving you any advice, have I? I will give advice. I'm very little to take care of me. Just do this for me. You just hang around here long enough that there's somebody who's been sober like a year or more and they drink again. Then you go look in their eyes. And if the absence of the power doesn't convince you, nothing ever will. I hope to God I never see that look in my eyes again, and I don't think I'll have to because I stay here and do the things this program asks me to do. I am a miracle. It's a miracle that a drunk like me hasn't had a drink in over 17 years because I couldn't stay sober three days when I took an abuse. I always drank with an abuse. The kids used to say, let's go watch Daddy go. Yeah. Had to drink. I had to drink. And I haven't had a drink in 17 and a half years almost. But that's not the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. The miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous is that I walk around loose in the world. In the skin, comfortably most of the time. Do you know what I said? I told you what I was like from the age of four. I walk around in the world most of the time comfortably. And sometimes, for like two and three weeks at a time, I walk around joyfully. If you're new, that makes you want to barf, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> but it's true. I don't ask you if you think it's going to happen to you. I just want you to believe that it happened to me. That, you know, I open my eyes in the morning sometimes just full of joy. And I don't know what you were like, but I never woke up in the morning where the first 30 seconds of my life wasn't terror. And most of the time, oh, well, quick, my age, you're glad to wake up, you know, but, but I wake up with this, you know, this happiness in me, glad to face the world, glad to be Cliff. That's the miracle of alcohol. Now, not that I don't drink. I want to drink. I have no reason to drink. I have found a way of life that I didn't think existed for a person like me. I knew there were happy people in the world my whole life. I read St. Francis of Assisi, for God's sakes. I'd seen al yeah. uh, But I never thought that a person like me could live comfortably and happy in the world. And this program was, I believe, designed by a loving God through Bill Wilson and the early pioneers for people like me to learn to live in the world comfortably and sometimes joyfully. You know, and that family turned out pretty well, too. That hashy salesman on my fourth AA birthday, he told Big Keith Carpenter, my dad has shown me how to live. He didn't say my dad told me how to live, my dad taught me how to live. He said, my dad has shown me how to live. That's the nicest thing anybody ever said about me in the program. He said I was a good example to him. And that's all I'll ever be, and that's all you'll ever be, is an example of the power in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that guy went on to college and graduated magna cum laude. You know, he served in the Peace Corps because he's a loving, spiritual man. 
He went back to Davis and got a master's degree. Now it makes ten times the money I do. And he's a bit, one of the best friends I have in the world. He's not, not afraid to put his arms around me and say, I love you. Because he was an agriculture major. We don't ask him what he grows. <laughs> None of my goddamn business, you know. Oh, he did his Peace Corps in Columbia. <laughs> Three of my kids, my, my wife, Alan, and I, we believe, you know, they're in training for the program, you know. But you can't tell somebody, and I love them anyway. I love them whether they get sober or they don't get sober, if they're in prison or if they're prison. I don't care. I love them for what they are today, and they love me for the same reason. And we were together at Christmas time. You could cut the love in that house with a meat cleaver. When we're together, it's just fun. And I say, I don't try it. You know, I tell them i got a chair safe for them when they're through having fun. <laughs> And they, just, they love the program. They never miss a birthday of mine if they're anywhere in the United States. You know, they, and they love the program. And they'll come here when they're ready, if they're ready. God took care of me all those years. He'll surely take care of them. You know, and those kids, when, when we were new, they put us through hoops of fire, or themselves through hoops of fire. You know, and our dark past is our greatest asset because when somebody's having a problem with their kids in Oceanside and Carlsbad, <laughs> they say, go see the roaches. They had it all. You know, and our dark past is our greatest asset. We're able to help lots of young couples with kids that are screwed up. And all we tell them is love them and wait. That's all you can do is love them and wait. I'm Cliff Roach, and I'm an alcoholic, and that means I can never drink again as long as I live. <laughs> but it also means that I'm immature. <laughs> and... Uh, it means that I need the steps and the sponsor and the friends and the meetings and the people, but especially the steps of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous to decrease that level of immaturity day by day on a daily basis to where I can learn to live in the world comfortably and sometimes joyfully. But when I say I'm an alcoholic, i got a much more important meaning than the other two. When I say I'm an alcoholic, I mean I am a member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm very proud of that. That's the best thing that ever happened to me in my whole life. I'm grateful for every drink I ever took, every bartender I ever bit. Because it got me to you. It got me to you and you taught me how to live comfortably and joyfully in the world. And to pay the world back. I have to read these sociologists in my work. I just love those guys. They're weirder than us, you know. Hope there's no sociologists here tonight. You know? The sociologists, their favorite word is alienation. Oh, they love that word. They italicize it whenever they write it. They never just write it. They say, that's what's wrong with Western civilization. We're alienated from each other. What they mean is that there's no sense in Western society of community anymore. No place where a person fits and where they belong and where they are loved and where they are allowed to love. And every time I read one of those clowns, I always think, why don't you drink a little more? <laughs> you drink as much as I drink, you'll find a place where you fit and where you belong and where you are loved, see. I'm in Reno, Nevada, and I belong in this room. I don't give a damn whether you think I do or not. I belong here. And I belong everywhere I go in Alcoholics Anonymous. I fit. And if you come to Carlsbad or Oceanside, you will be loved and you will fit. I don't know if my nonsense did anybody any good. I didn't want I came here tonight. I came here to say this. I don't know if there's anybody in this room who really needs me. But I want to tell you one thing for sure. I sure as hell need you. <laughs> <laughs>